Um, you actually did one of the things that I was going to make uh, uh, and, and say it. We will talk, I think it's important that we talk a, a lot about what, as you are the first, what we're going to see this week, uh, what we saw in the breakfast, but also I think it's very important to say we have six new administrations in Latin America for, for next year, so there's a lot of excitement on what we could do, how can uh, AWS be working more connected with the new administration. Yeah, and then there's also some uh, questions too that I know are going to come up and why I'm going to have a couple people speak. Um, so first of all, thank you for making the trip, sincerely. Uh, for those that have, have come before, welcome back to those that haven't. Um, it's going to be a busy couple of days. Um, I apologize, I wasn't able to join last night some of the things that Rachel was pulling together. Um, this is going to be a busy week of announcements. Um, we, it, if you haven't come before, when we first got started with reInvent, we wondered if anyone would come. It's been a while. Uh, will we get a thousand people all to come to really a conference which is different? It's a conference that focuses on education. We have over 2,100 sessions that we are doing um, across multiple properties. We first had just a very few, now over 50,000. Um, attendance is up over 17% year over year on the overall group. I looked at the Latin America, Canada, and the Caribbean numbers. Attendance is up over 47% year over year that's coming. And that doesn't include the numbers that we anticipate that will be watching the uh, webinars and more that we are broadcasting out. So for those that aren't familiar, tomorrow, Andy Jassy, our CEO, Sakino, as well as Werner uh, Vogels, our CIO, uh, our Chief Technology Officer, sorry. Um, are they're being broadcasted out. And so, you know, even that will, will have even more. Um, and so we got a lot of announcements, but what's interesting is not really, uh, you know, our announcements are exciting, but the sessions where we have customers and partners, our services teams have flown from around the globe to go ahead and hear and talk with our customers and attendees as they think about what's next. Over 90% of our roadmap is driven by our customers. We have millions of active customers now. Um, and that other 10%, well, one of you asked me the other day in, in a meeting, but well, what about that other 10%, you know? <laughs> and it's actually the data mapping we do. It's where we look at what is Sydney and Santiago and Stockholm, uh, Vancouver and others are all asking uh, for. And that's where the innovation wheel is going to go ahead and continue. And you get to hear this uh, this week. Um, last year, we had, over the last preceding 12 months, over 1,400 updates, service, or enhancements. Now, it keeps my SA teams mm. very busy trying to uh, learn, but it also keeps our partner um, ecosystem, our whole partner system, very active. And we're doing things throughout the region, in Mexico City, <coughs> in Brasilia, in Sao Paulo, in Santiago, in Buenos Aires, and more. Where we're having sessions where we're training our Amazon partners to go ahead and provide the myriad of solutions at a local level that can go ahead and do amazing things. And that's where we've really seen innovation in Latin America. And the rest of the world is starting to really take notice. And that's a lot of fun. It's one of the best parts of my job is I get to go ahead and, and share what is occurring. Um, take some of the things that you all just heard. Uh, you know, we are very honored to go ahead and support the Mexico elections. 83 million people went to the polls, 150,000 uh, polling, <coughs> electing uh, 3,406 offices across Mexico, powered by AWS underneath this group, uh, two partners, um, multiple uh, services were involved, especially wrapped around security. And that was one of the core parts, using AWS services like guard duty and other activities. Lambda, absolutely involved there. And what was really exciting was that we're, there were over 45,000 international observers that were watching to make sure that everything was going right. Um, and it went, you know, perfectly where we went ahead and briefed 932 of your, uh, your peers that were all camped out around uh, the center part looking for the election results and being able to not only give the election results, but to go ahead and drill down into the data uh, that's there. Um, we had a very busy weekend going through that elections. I didn't sleep much. Uh, Guillermo's team did not sleep. Uh, <laughs> 
We had our big events team, for those that don't know, for larger activities or those um, that we, uh, our partners or governments ask for additional services. We had our big events teams on watch. Alex's and Glaber's team were heavily involved in making sure that everything ran incredibly well, and it did. In fact, there was actually one application that was on a on-premise that then started to get under attack, and the teams jumped in and helped move it to the cloud, wrapped it with guard duty and more to go ahead and have that continue. Is something on the store off. The power of the cloud that we could go ahead and do. But it's not just in Mexico. Guatemala, Ministry of Education, as an example. In Colombia, Computamaras. If we go into uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo, um, Carmenete, am I pronouncing that right, Rachel? Carmenete. Thank you. Someday I will pronounce it right. Um, where together with the city of Sao Paulo, enabling um, anyone with one of the video cameras to be able to share at their home, to share it with local law enforcement, to go ahead and increase security. IoT on the edge being able to go ahead and be done. But it's not just customers using the technology, but it's also our programs. In Santiago, we have an initiative with the U.S. Embassy in Inacamp right now where we are training 15 um, students on English. One of the Chilean parts. students? Chilean students, yes. And I'm not, I don't want just 15 students, I want 15,000 students on English. Because when we talked with President Pinero, one of the big priorities was help us in different ways to have the talent base that's there. And one of the issues as a blocker was, hey, we need to help on English. So we did a partnership yeah. with the U.S. Embassy. That's growing quickly. But it's not only those types of programs that we're doing throughout the region, but it's also preparing future generations for the workforce. Since last year, for those that went ahead and, and were with us, we've added 87 universities now to the AWS Educate program, a program that enables faculty and students alike the tools, capabilities, at no charge to go ahead and learn about cloud computing, to experiment in Portuguese, in Spanish, um, 14 different learning paths. So if a student in at University of the Andes um, in Colombia wants to learn about cybersecurity at 2.30, 2 in the morning, they can do it. And then, or that may be a student in Tegucigalpa at the university that wants to go ahead and play with IoT, they can do that for no cost. They start experimenting uh, more and more. And so across the region, there's amazing innovation that's occurring in elections, in IoT, as we think about um, St. Kitts disaster response services that we're doing now. They have snowball device outside of their data center. So if hurricanes come, they can have continuity of government. Uh, many of you heard in regards to uh, Teresa talking about disaster response mm -hmm. early on. We're in the final stages of actually having a GO team available because <coughs> if you look across many of your countries, there's a massive fault line that goes over up, up the coast and having team members to be available, you know, to help and more. You know, some of the stuff that Alex's team uh, is being certified. And so as we think about the innovation, <coughs> think about the support that we're seeing throughout the region, um, Innovation is occurring, it's exciting to see, all types of things. The programs aligned with government priorities, um, and then it's working with some of the new administrations. Now, uh, before opening up for questions, there's one part I wanted uh, John to actually speak on because it's part of her, uh, part of his, her view. And that's what do we think about for infrastructure? Uh, many of you have asked and written stories. When is Amazon coming to this country or that country? And, how do you think about infrastructure all up? And I thought it might be good for John um, just to chat a little bit of how we think about infrastructure in countries and the various forms. And then we'll go ahead, Rachel, we'll just open up for questions. Sure. Okay. Hi again. Um, I also thought it'd be good just to review a few of the terms that we use to make sure that um, it's clear when I start talking about them. Uh, so our business really was pioneering cloud computing more than 12 years ago. Uh, Amazon was starting to see some of its internal projects and external projects slow down. And when our leadership, including Andy Jesse, looked into it, we found that we were constantly waiting on the infrastructure that we needed. We either needed a new dev test environment or we needed a production environment. 
And so we you know, reimagined how can you provide significant capacity ahead of demand so that customers, whether it's a government or a startup, could very transparently see the price, push a button, and have what they needed immediately, and then start that experimentation process. Now we, we had these, this vision based on 10 years of running the infrastructure for Amazon.com. And that was a global business that needed to be in countries around the world, it was based on you know, understanding how, where the network was gonna go of e-commerce, where the investment was in terms of uh, people coming online, you know, first to computers and laptops and later to phones. And some of the design patterns that we saw in there we carried forward into AWS. For instance, having at least three data centers whenever we operate, rather than just two data centers. It gives a much higher fault tolerance and availability strategy. We also uh, became very aware of the reliability of networks and what it took to run a reliable network. And so we wanted to ensure that um, we would be able to deliver a good experience to our customers. And finally, because we'd started off as a bookseller, um, you know, we, we were operating with the margins of a bookseller, which is you know, a very small percentage. I was recently you know, trying to uh, put a project together for us and we needed to buy some third party hardware and through the negotiations, we were able to get them to lower the price almost 80%. So there are a lot of other hardware vendors out there that had some significant margins. And um, that turns into costs for our customers, which is sort of the two leadership principles that we bring to our infrastructure decisions, uh, I think principally, are frugality. So just like everyone else, we want a low cost so we can have a low price. And then insist on highest standards. We want the services to work. We want the electricity to be functioning. We want the network to be up. And we want it to be survivable through a variety of you know, natural or man-made disasters that could happen. And so as we look at how we serve our customers, uh, we begin by trying to understand the world that they live in. You know, what, is, what are the laws and regulations in this country? Uh, how pervasively have people adopted the internet and mobile? Or is e-commerce going? And we get advice from our customers too. We see who's adopting early. We hear them come in and ask for some of the capabilities that we offer. And so then when we when we begin to go into a company, you know, it begins with um, I think what any other uh, company does is they're trying to do international expansion, whether it's someone coming out of Latin America into Canada or a Canadian company trying to go over to Europe. Um, once you've done that due diligence and understand how to operate, you start to put uh, people on the ground. You start to employ uh, local employees who can help guide uh, what you do in the country. And so we, uh, like many other companies, will create what's called a marketing entity or a sales and support entity who can go in and, and start to have the direct conversations with customers. Uh, the press is often very reliable about what's going on in a country, but they're not necessarily able to get to the buying decisions and you know what are the variables that customers are thinking about. And so it's, it's very important for us to be able to go get that firsthand experience. The next thing we look for uh, is how can we begin to serve the community there with content? And so you're probably familiar now with our edge locations. We've got dozens and dozens, more than 100 edge locations now. When we go into an edge location, this is a multi-million dollar investment uh, with a local company. It's often a, a telecommunications provider or a combination of a telecommunications provider and a co-location or data center hosting company. Because we need to be able to store the racks that we're going to land in the country. It needs to be connected to the local network so that we can start uh, offering things like uh, you know, Amazon Prime Video or that we can support customers like Netflix with the content that they want to deliver or improve the resiliency of the web experience for local customers. So for instance, when we add an edge location, it comes with some pretty critical services like uh, AWS Shield, um, and that sort of a service lets you as customers stay where you are in your current data centers, begin to route your internet traffic through the AWS Shield, and in turn, you start to pick up denial of service protection and the same sorts of protections that we want to afford Amazon.com and all of the other customers who are doing commerce on the web. So this is very important for uh, universities and schools who in the past have been the frequent target of uh, cyber criminals or, or other organizations trying to maybe use the lower budgets of schools and the less secure environments that they have to, to do sort of all the the sad things you see going on on the internet. Um, 
We also then can add to that capability one of the services Jeff mentioned, which is uh, Snowball and now Snowball Edge clusters. So in the past, you know, customers were trying to move their data into AWS. Um, you know, you can saturate a network by moving significant, uh, certainly terabytes or petabytes of data in, and we have customers that do that. And so sometimes it's more expedient just to use a Snowball drive, work with DHL or UPS or some other delivery service like an AWS Solution Architect, and uh, get it to the data center so that customers can get their data in to a great service like Glacier or the simple storage service, get the protections from our encryption and get the significantly lower price. How many people just out of curiosity have seen one of the Snowball devices? Sorry? Has seen one of the Snowball one devices. One of our Snowball, Snowball devices. So I strongly encourage, it's about the size of a Tumi suitcase, fully encrypted and, and more. They, um, the storage team has a, has a great expo area that they're showing it now. And I would definitely go ahead, and in different configuration, whole live production type of things. Um, Rachel, let's be sure to take them uh, on over just to see. Because sometimes all of a sudden you're like, wow, now I see what you're This is the cloud, this is the part of the cloud you can touch. So you definitely want to go <laughs> experience that. Um, and you can take turns picking it up for exercise, it's about 45 now. Yeah, I was going to say, just want to say, <laughs> Rachel, take it around, like, yeah. <laughs> and to deliver that sort of a service and with Snowball Edge cluster, now customers also have compute and not just storage. Um, so this becomes a device that customers can run in their data center or in situations like Jeff alluded to with the disaster recovery. For instance, maybe you're trying to go into Puerto Rico, you're trying to help quickly identify who's coming into the Red Cross camps. You know, what's their identity? How do they get reconnected with family members that they're looking for? How do they start to register, you know, the home that they were in that could have damage? This is the kind of device that's uh, proven to operate very well in such austere conditions. Uh, so that's an important capability that we can get into countries. And, and of course, we need to work with all the local uh, customs and duties uh, to import and export this, this capability. So that's another critical step for us. Uh, as we add in the edge locations, it's also an opportunity for us to meet the local telecommunications providers. We're going to be a customer of theirs, leveraging their networks. Um, we certainly look for um, high re highly reliable networks, and we look for affordable networks. Uh, and if you look around the world, telecommunications companies are in various uh, stages of deregulation, commercialization. Uh, they're leaping ahead in some cases to 5G already or 4G. And so, you know, having that close relationship with them as a, as a customer and then a partner is really important to us. Um, you saw maybe in Peter DeSantis's uh, speech last night, the map of our global networks, the ability for customers, especially governments who need to run foreign ministries in other countries, uh, or certainly multinational corporations that have operations in several countries, want the reliability and security of that global network. And so then, Finally, when we see significant demand in a country and we see customers looking for the, the local uh, latency, um, we have an opportunity to try to build an AWS region. Um, an AWS region is a collection of availability zones. We have 57 availability zones today. We have 15 more that are coming. And an availability zone is what we call a logical entity. It is basically a name that points to a lot of physical entities, which are called our data centers. Um, an availability zone could have one data center, or it could have, in some cases, five or even ten. Um, and the data centers are, are very large. So if you can think of your largest retail store or your largest soccer pitch that you'd want to go visit, um, these data centers can be larger than, than even those uh, kinds of facilities. Um, and John, sorry. Yes. And this is a very important point for us because many of the countries here, the news has been, oh, is AWS coming at a data center? What I like, and yesterday Peter repeated like many times what is availability zones. It is showing exactly what you're saying, how robust is the, the structure. Right. So this is a very good way to express it. It's not only about one single data center and how we compose the region. Right. It's those multiple data centers and then the inter-availability zone bandwidth that we establish between them so that in essence they operate as a contiguous uh, unit. Um, we rely upon a significant amount of power to operate these. 
Uh, I think you can readily see our, our record for pursuing renewable energy and ensuring that uh, we are part of the solution for reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, there's a significant amount of, uh, unfortunately, data centers out there that don't have the same uh, kind of uh, efficiency that the hyperscale cloud service providers are able to deliver. So I think that's uh, an important component to the solution as we're evaluating. And um, we want to have multiple providers. Uh, multiple providers ensure there's competition on price, and it also ensures there's competition on quality. And so we'll spend a significant amount of time ensuring that we get the right price and we get the right uh, service level agreements through the various agreements we have to sign with providers. Because when the network is down or the power is off, there is no cloud. And so it, this is a significant part of how we think about uh, investing. And we're, we're definitely willing to work with um, the local providers on improving their capacity and, and really helping them step up their game. Uh, it, it not only improves the experience for our customers, but as other uh, providers come in, whether they be other co-location data center providers or other hyperscale cloud uh, service providers, uh, then everyone in turn benefits from those improvements in the reliability of power or the, or the reduced costs. Because the last thing we want to do is build a region where the prices higher for people in the country than for them to go to you know, a data center in another country for us. So we'll spend a lot of time on that. We're willing to um, be misunderstood. You know, we're willing to be uh, accused of being slow-footed in, in how we think about this because uh, these are even more significant investments and we wanna make sure that we can deliver the best possible service, that, that great AWS experience across the globe so that there's really no difference for customers. And so that's how we think about it. And that can, that can be a multi-year process in terms of the, the due diligence that we go through. Uh, we're increasing the number of staff we have available to help us do these business cases and complete this due diligence. And uh, as our CEO says, in the fullness of time, you know, you'll probably see AWS infrastructure in, in virtually every country. And so we'll, we look forward to working with um, local companies and governments on how we can really pave the way for AWS infrastructure investment and uh, that of Amazon or others after us. So then taking a look at, at what John said, and then I'll open for questions. I look at when we started this business three and a half years ago. Uh, we had an Amazon, so it's not only us, but also our retail side. We had about um, 300 or so people in Costa Rica, about that or so, uh, less than that in Sao Paulo. Jump forward now. We have retail operations and AWS in Mexico, um, big offices in the Santa Fe area uh, that we've got. Um, we have offices in uh, Bogota, in Santiago, in Buenos Aires. We have uh, expanded dramatically our Brazil footprint. Our region has over 200 new services over the last year that we've added to the, um, to the infrastructure that John just mentioned. And in Sao Paulo, continuing to go ahead and grow and more. And, Add in as well uh, for Columbia, we just announced 600 customer service representatives. So it's our retail side, it's not the AWS side. And there's the, some questions in regards to that. We're hiring to help on the, um, help support our retail side. You know, we have a global routing system. So if anyone wants assistance in French or Portuguese, in Spanish, Portuguese, um, out of Bogota, it gets routed and subset so there's someone in Vancouver that wants to chat with someone on their where's my package in Spanish it actually gets routed through to Costa Rica or it could end up in Bogota and so you know both you know the company continues to invest in Latin America and it's not only the innovation side but it's also what we're doing with our partner community we have tens of thousands of partners now that are building successful um, businesses employing locals uh, getting trained on up and so you're going to continue to see us uh, invest in the region. It's going to be exciting to see what this next year. Mm -hmm. Rachel and I are going through what's happened since last year. Like, you know, now we're going to see what happens next. And I, I think that the critical distinction that Jeff's making too is that often uh, when we're talking with certainly governments or their economic development authorities, uh, unfortunately, they have the perception that building a data center is going to have a lot of jobs. Now, there's certainly good jobs in the construction phase of the data center, but you don't uh, offer really low prices and meet our frugality leadership principle if you 
you know, gild the lily, as you might say. You know, so adding a lot of unnecessary features and uh, bells and whistles to the data center, like you know, neon signs and great paint colors and things like that, or by uh, putting in more people than you need to. So, whereas there could be dozens of jobs in the data centers, there are hundreds of jobs and thousands of jobs writing the software that enables you to run an election on the cloud or to you know, collect taxes on the cloud or to take your entrance exams for college in the cloud. So part of it is helping governments understand that you really need to think about the next economy that you're going to build and where the opportunities for growth are going to be. And so we'll, we like to spend time there. And, and then we'll bring a program like our Cloud Start program, which is focused on uh, building on the great work that the Educate program does, where it invests in small and medium enterprises who are looking to build a, a business on AWS that's going to support the government or educational institutions or the health uh, healthcare sector. And so that's that's a really important investment in our part, we think, is to, to help people start to reimagine what the economy can be like for them, what the experience of government can be like for them, and ensure that those those partner companies form and flourish. Um, so that's just the other I think, critical point to make. And, it's, and every single country, every single, for all of you, every single country you represent, we are having those types of discussions with the mm -hmm. administration, whether they're brand new, coming in, um, existing ones that have come in since August, let's say for instance in Colombia, President Macri down in uh, Argentina, and <coughs> how do we help on driving <coughs> economic growth in startup communities? How do we help? have the talent there so the government can modernize and more. And so for all the administrations, existing and new ones coming in, it's that type of economic discussions. We're already proactively having, which is going to be fun to see what happens. Okay. Well, that'll open up. So now it's time for you guys. Yeah, I have three questions. <laughs> uh, first, I heard that you have not local numbers, like for each country, right? Jews, I have global numbers for adoption of Amazon Web Services. So I think the only way to know how things are going is asking you sure. uh, how things are doing in Chile, specifically with the government, because you've been speaking about projects, but what yeah. about inversion? Uh, because I remember you had... Um, like an agreement with Startup Chile, yep. but I don't remember anything else. And Startup Chile is still being like many so uh, classist sure. uh, in Chile, yeah. And uh, yeah, I cannot remember that. So I was wondering if you're planning to grow in Chile as you're doing in Colombia or in Mexico. Sure. Yeah, and so, and maybe Rachel, I'll let you guide on terms of but where we go country specific, I, I can dive into mm -hmm. any of the uh, wonderful countries here. I'll mention, I'll talk first on Chile. Um, we've had a very long standing relationship with the prior administration under President Bachelet and now with President Pinera. Um, we are excited to open an office in uh, Santiago. And in fact, we just moved the office because we outgrew it so quickly. Um, How many people do you have there? We don't report our individual numbers. Um, but uh, if you were to go ahead and look on the websites, our Amazon jobs, you'll see across all of the region we're growing. You're going to see them significantly increase as we just go into a new fiscal year. Uh, I can tell you, my team is asking you to release numbers of where we're going to already <laughs> grow and where I can do it. So you're going to see all the offices uh, grow very quickly, both in our commercial services, our public sector businesses, and more. Um, we had a delightful conversation with President Pinera in uh, late May, June time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa and I had the opportunity to be there. Uh, we, she came on a trip where we went to Argentina as well as Chile. Um, so the administration has been very proactive in a lot of areas. I commend Minister Valente in particular, uh, who's taken a very special interest in working with us. Um, Startup Chile, Invest Chile, um, the different ministries are very quickly adopting cloud. I would also highlight the engagement we have with the U.S. Embassy uh, there, in particular, Ambassador Perez has been a very big uh, proponent. Um, and so, and especially in education, it, we've seen, uh, we have nine, ten, we can get the exact number, universities in uh, Chile okay. that are now part of AWS Educate. As I mentioned, we're doing, we're piloting mm -hmm. 
a new course on English. Um, and then another program that we are gonna be bringing to Chile, as well as other countries, is one that I piloted up in Canada. It's called DigiGov. Um, DigiGov. DigiGov. Um, it's a, we worked with um, Prime Minister Trudeau's administration to help modernize the IT staff in government. So as we think about AWS Educate as how do we prepare future generations for the workforce, mm. college students, post-secondary schools, well, what about all the IT staff in government? How do we help them understand what they can do? And so we uh, piloted a course, we have a long wait list already uh, that we're, we're gonna expand. And it was to train IT professionals, government employees on cloud computing, the basics. But we're also going advanced, big data analytics, internet of things technology for traffic <coughs> conditions and more. We're bringing that to Latin America uh, in this next year. And as part of our commitment in each of your uh, countries, we're working with the administrations on this. But specifically, I'm sorry, for Chile, are you planning like to we're gonna be do doing this Digigup. board or for we're gonna the be next doing, year? We're going to be doing DigiGup in Chile. In Chile. Uh, for the next year? For next year. Uh, we're we doing had a grant, for, education. Uh, in Chile, we also, um, University of Chile, mm -hmm. uh, Center for Mathematical Modeling, is oh, having it, a yeah. really big challenge. Mm -hmm. The professors couldn't do research. They had to wait four or five months to go ahead yeah, and have access the data so big. for the big data. Mm -hmm. that so they applied for it and they received a million dollars of grant money to use on to advance. It science. was recently. Uh, this was uh, back at the end of Q2. It's mm -hmm. really taking off now, and so we're doing quite a bit um, okay. in Chile, okay. which is exciting. Okay, to see. Uh, one more question. Sure. <laughs> uh, when you see the central government in Chile since my opinion because i've been speaking with all of them yeah. it seems to be they seems to be more related with microsoft i, I don't know if you agree uh, but when you speak with local governments municipalities in yeah. fact they're use they they're they're using amazon because the obvious is cheaper it's easier for them uh, so i was wondering if you can tell me if you've been speaking with them local governments for example there is a place called renca They're mm -hmm. doing exactly the same you're doing with the kids, yep. uh, but with security. And they're using Amazon platform. I don't know if you yep. know it. I do. Uh, and also they're trying to do with education. Uh, I, I have the contact of this guy, so I can give it to you. But they're doing really good things in this place called Renka, which is a very poor place. Uh, so it could it could be interesting. What are you doing in the company? By the way, Jose, you are a user also. You yeah. Know you <laughs> so you know how to So one is that we're seeing governments throughout the region go ahead and use AWS in so many ways, both at the local level but also at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And one of the things interesting, since you mentioned that, what we're seeing now is a is a lot of customers looking to move their Microsoft workloads into AWS. You may not know that we actually are one of Microsoft's biggest partners, and it's by design because we know that you know the history and the legacy Microsoft mm. systems on premise. Now we have customers saying, "I want to run Microsoft um, SQL Server. I, I see SQL Server 2008 is having end of life in June. Help me go ahead and move these workloads quickly." We support SQL Server, SharePoint, Exchange, and more in AWS. So the Customers that have had legacy Microsoft systems on um, investments, Windows Active Server directories, and more. We have really close interaction. And so we're seeing those workloads move very rapidly. Um, rural side to the major metropolitan cities in each of your countries uh, we're involved in. And it's in new and different ways. It may be helping a municipality, like in um, south of uh, Sao Paulo, and we'll remember the name, running websites. Uh, and just communicating with citizens and more, more sophisticated workloads. Yeah, yeah because when they, I, I spoke with the CEO of the municipality yeah. and I told him, oh, this is really cool. And they said, yeah, we want to do more, but we can't uh, well, And I, I told him, I'm going to meet with them, so I'm going to tell Send them, go email. speak to you. <laughs> give, the, give them my email. I'll make yeah. sure you all have. So we're seeing it in, in, at all ranges. Yeah, because they're right. doing very well and they're very poor <laughs> community, so it right. could be very interesting. And the last question, uh, I saw that you've been looking for a country manager since a lot of time ago. It's like a year ago, and you keep looking for it, keep looking for it. Uh, I don't know if you already have the guy or the woman, and why is it so hard? 
to um, accomplish with the can, profile? Can or? Yeah, sure. One of the things that's important is, so we have, for in each country that we are operating, we have the public sector team, and we have also the commercial that goes uh, directly and to you're, the private. In Chile, you're looking for the commercial one? Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. We had someone, actually, I, I like to say when I hear you say about what happened last year, mm -hmm. even before we had the office, there were so many things happening now. The thing is that now it's just speeding up so much. So we had someone, and now we are finding someone again for the commercial replacement. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <coughs> like he, Jeff is directly connected to, to Chile. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I, I would say one part, what we look for, we need builders. You we need what? We need builders. Yeah. We need um, staff that are obsessed over what the customers are going to go, that are focused on them, not on us. Mm -hmm. We need people that align with our 14 leadership principles. That we have, which you, can, you all can, can see, we live those every day, and we want to make sure that when we um, go ahead and hire, it is with someone that has that startup mentality, that's a builder, that's obsessed, and we do not want to go ahead and drop that bar. It's an any role; it doesn't, it's not a management specific, it's any role. And so, um, we're not going to rush to hire any position. We're going to make sure that we hire the right people. Because even if it takes a year. <laughs> right. even, even that person's out there, they just don't know it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it may take us a while, and that's okay. Um, because it's the right thing to do for our customers yeah. at the end of the day. No, and I really want to congratulate you because of the, the project you have with the embassy. Yes. But as I suggest, you should go forward uh, with coding. Because in Chile, there's, yep. ¿cómo se dice? Como, faltan muchos. Yep. We don't have enough... Uh, capital, uh, human capital in, yeah, the in technology. Yeah. So it will be great to start working maybe with municipalities or local governments We've been uh, with coding. Yeah. So like Codea and mm -hmm. Monica Renke, who yeah. is the executive director. I don't know if you heard about Laboratorio yeah. also. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So we're doing quite too. a bit. In, I mean, sure, but in other ones, uh, countries as well. Yeah, but it will be great. Keep us in business. Uh, how dynamic is the demand or, or the needs of the public sector in the digital performation? You know, it's in general speaking in Latin America. It, it's been an interesting journey over the last couple of years, um, and what I'm seeing now, it's not a question of are we going to go to cloud. What we're hearing is help us sprint to cloud. And so the conversation has changed over the years. At first it was more, I'm kind of interested about this. Now, and then we had some absolutely amazing forward leading CIOs in Mexico, Segurapa, um, which is one of uh, Guillermo's customers, providing, using cloud to provide daily commodity prices out for farmers in the agricultural side, to websites that were getting hacked in, um, by the government, and now, hey, how do I help wrap this with security? So now what we're finding across Every, every country that we've talked to. Um, cloud's the new normal, help me go fast. What are the global best practices that are there? What's Australia done, or Canada, United Kingdom, Singapore, you know, and others? Not just the United States.